This happened during the reign of Emperor Rudolf II, who had a keen interest in astrology and alchemy, and even dabbled in astronomy and occult arts. At that time, an extremely learned and sagacious man, High Rabbi Lev ben Bezalel, lived in the Prague ghetto. That wise Rabbi Lev, who was also known as the Maharal, had many children from his wife Pearl, but still the couple took into their family the orphan, Rachel, who had lost her parents in a pogrom. The Maharal was well-versed in mathematics, astronomy, Talmud, and Kabbalah, and could hold his own in disputations with learned foreign masters at the emperor's court. But not even the emperor's benevolence could stop the mistreatment of Jews who were often attacked, beaten, and even killed by their enemies. To protect his people, Rabbi Lev decided to make Gollum, a clay man of supernatural strength. In his books, the rabbi found a recipe for making such a man, but he could not find suitable clay. Then, three nights in a row, he had the same dream in which he saw a place on the banks of the Voltava River with a patch of peculiar red clay caressed constantly by gentle waves. At the next full moon he swore to secrecy his favorite pupil Jacob and his future son-in-law Isaac, the groom of his favorite daughter Rachel, and led them upstream along the river's bank. After a long walk, they came to a place that resembled exactly the riverbank in Rabbi Love's dream. There, in the fine red clay washed to a silky smoothness by the river's crystal clear water, the rabbi drew a figure of a huge man. Then his favorite pupil Jacob walked around the outline figure from right to left reading magic words that Rabbi Lev found in his book of Kabbalah. He read the words first, then he read each letter as a number, and then he added them and read the numbers corresponding to each word. The clay dried out completely. Then the rabbi's son-in-law walked around the clay figure from left to right and read the words and numbers backwards. The clay figure became red hot. Then the rabbi himself walked around the drawn figure both from right to left and left to right and he read the numbers and words both forwards and backwards. The clay figure cooled, its rough skin became moist, and finally the man of clay began to breathe. Rabbi Lev took a Shem, a small scroll with the most secret name of the Highest One, and he put the Shem into the clay man's mouth. Gollum opened his eyes. Now rise up. Your name will be Joseph, and your only task will be to protect my people from their enemies. Gollum slowly stood, towering over the three humans. Then he followed the rabbi as obediently as a house-trained puppy. He looked just like a man, but a huge one, perhaps eight feet tall and of a rather crude build. His skin, the color of unglazed earthenware, was rough. He didn't need to eat, drink, or sleep. He was as strong as an ox, and he could work without stopping day and night. He looked and behaved like a human, but he lacked the ability to speak. Since he had been created by a mere mortal man, he was an imperfect being. 
Gollum appeared wherever enemies were attacking the Jews. He walked quietly for such a huge man, and he would steal up on the attackers, hug half a dozen of them in his long arms, and bang their heads together. No man could stand up to him, for he was able to stop a heavy stick and break it with his bare hands. Knives slid off his skin, and some say not even a bullet could hurt him. The word about the mighty protector of the ghetto soon got around. A few times the enemies of the Jews tried to ambush Gollum, but their attempts were futile. They came away with bruises and broken bones. In the end, they preferred to keep away from the ghetto and the Jews could finally live in peace. Gollum was idle. He would pass time sitting on a bench in Rabbi's front yard, bathing in the sun all day long. The Rabbi's wife, Pearl, would have liked to put the huge fellow to work around the house, but her husband forbade her to ever ask Gollum for help. A sacred instrument will do only sacred tasks, he told her again and again when she complained about the lazy man of clay. On Sabbath, Rabbi always removed the Shem from Gollum's mouth and let him have a day of rest. Pearl observed the rules set down by her husband, but once, just before the Feast of Pesach, she had more work than ever. As she ran past the reposing golem for the tenth time, Pearl thought, It can do no harm if the Schmendrick lends a hand just this once. And without delay, she told Gollum, I have to do some shopping now. Why don't you bring some water to the kitchen while I'm gone? Gollum nodded, and Pearl was off to the market, happy to be spared one hard task. But when she came back from the marketplace, the smile froze on her lips. A stream of water was pouring from the kitchen, and a crowd of lamenting neighbors surrounded the house. It's the flood! The flood! The flood is coming! They yelled one over the other. Nothing of the kind, said a tall man standing quietly in the back of the crowd. God sent the flood to punish mankind for grievous sins, but this is only a punishment for my disobedient wife. It was the rabbi himself who had been observing calmly the dismal scene. It was only now that Pearl noticed Gollum. Sloshing knee-deep in the streaming water, he burst into the house, emptied two big buckets into the huge puddle on the kitchen floor, and ran out to the well for more. You can stop now, called Rabbi Lev, and let this be a lesson for everybody, that sacred vessels be used only for sacred tasks. But once again, when the rabbi's daughter was getting married, Pearl was so overwhelmed with all the chores for the happy occasion that despite her husband's strict prohibition, she thought, to help with a wedding, after all, is a holy task. And she sent Gollum to the riverside to buy fish and to the market for some apples. Gollum was lucky, for just as he came to the riverbank, the fisherman was pulling in a huge carp. The big fellow gave the fisherman a fistful of money, slid the carp under his shirt, and hurried back to town. The fish tossed and turned unhappily, and its tail sticking out through Gollum's collar kept slapping his cheeks. 
it was too much for even a clay man to take. He pulled the carp out, slapped it back a few times, and tossed it into the river for punishment. Then he went to the marketplace to get some apples. He had only one grosh left in his pocket, which he handed to a substantial woman at a fruit stand. With her meaty hand, the woman shoved the grosh into her apron and handed Gollum one shriveled green apple. The clay mountain was not happy, but he could only roll his eyes and wave his arms to show he wanted more. What's your fault? The woman snapped at him. You found more apples? Why don't you just take the whole stand? At these words, Gollum gesticulated and nodded his head cheerfully. Then he picked up the stand, lifted it above his head, and strode towards Rabbi's house. Apples were flying in all directions, while the fruit seller screamed as if someone was cutting off her head. Gollum didn't stop until he reached the rabbi's front yard, where he deposited the fruit stand so unceremoniously it was reduced to kindling. Now, what have you done, you pagan? moaned the rabbi's wife. Gollum, as usual, didn't say a word. But the apple woman yelled for two. She had to be paid a considerable sum to keep quiet. After that, the rabbi's wife walked quietly around Gollum, not daring to ask him to lift as much as a single piece of straw. Years went by. One Friday afternoon, Rabbi was late for the synagogue, and in his hurry he forgot to take the Shem out of Gollum's mouth to give him a rest for the Sabbath. He had already begun the evening prayer when his neighbors came running to the temple shouting, Gollum! Gollum is destroying the ghetto! Gollum! Gollum is destroying our ghetto! The rabbi followed them to his house. There, in the courtyard, lay a pile of splinters that used to be his furniture, together with thatches and rafters which Gollum tore off his roof. At the very moment the rabbi arrived, his clay servant was about to beat the life out of his domestic animals. Without a word, the rabbi looked in Gollum's eyes. The clay man froze in mid-swing. Rabbi Lev strode fearlessly to the reddish hulk. Gollum shook. He lifted the huge beam over his head. Would he strike his creator? Stop, rabbi. Don't go any closer. The weight of the beam alone could crush your head. Rabbi advanced. Gollum's clay muscles rippled, and his rough skin glowed as if he was inside a firing kiln. Rabbi advanced. Now the man mountain was moving too. Each took a step. One more and they would collide. Then... Slowly, Rabbi lifted his hand and took the Shem out of the clay giant's mouth. Gollum swayed for a long, long while and then crashed to the ground.
that was the last time he moved, for the rabbi never put the Shem in his mouth again. They carried the clay hulk to the old new synagogue's attic, and there it most likely fell to dust. But some people say that if the oppression of the Jews becomes unbearable, Gollum will rise again to defend them. (laughs) ¶¶ 